All right, whatever. We'll figure it out. Chapter 4 of James. Chapter 4 of James. What is the source of your quarrels and conflicts amongst you? Boy, there's a question. Is not the source of your pleasure that wage war in your members? For you lust and you do not have, so you commit murders. And you are envious and you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives so that you may spend it on your own lusts and pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is actually hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be the friend of the world will make himself an enemy of the Lord. Or do you think that scriptures speak to no purpose? For he is jealous he jealously desires the Spirit, and He has made us to dwell in us. He gives a greater grace, therefore, it says, that God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. <clears throat> Submit, therefore, yourselves unto the Lord. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, O sinners. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and let Him exalt you. Do not speak against one another, my brothers. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the whole law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are no longer a doer of the law, but a judge of it. And there is only one lawgiver and only one judge. The one who is able to save and the one who is able to destroy. But who are you that you should judge your neighbor? Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we shall go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a great profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a, a while and then quickly vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and also do this or do that. But as it is, you boast in your own arrogance and all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it becomes a sin. What do you think about that? There's a lot of hope for me. What's that? There's a lot of hope for me. Oh, well, there's plenty of hope for you. Uh, I know that for a fact because you're kind and sweet. Now, on my case... Well, that's another story. That's why I'm good at excuses. <laughs> it wasn't my fault, Lord. It was Katie's. What do you think about this? You know where this is going because James knows it very well. James knows it very well because he and Jesus didn't quite get along all the time. So, consequently, what do you think would be James' problem? Judgment. What do you think James' bigger problem is? Self-righteousness. What do you think James' bigger, <laughs> bigger problem is? He has a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's James. That's the point I'm trying to make. You see, there's. you can say I've been a Christian for 30 years, or you can say I've been a Christian for 40 years. I mean, that doesn't make any difference, really. Remember, God is a timeless God. Only the, the difference between 30 years and 45 years is that you've had more time to practice and should know better. And she can look to you and say, well, I've, I'm quandered, quandaried about this. What should I do? And then you can help her and say, well, I had that problem 30 years ago and this is what I did. 
and it worked out great. Or you can say, I had that problem 30 years ago, and this is what I did, and it worked out terrible. You know, you can give some advice to the younger heart, and that's all through Scripture. And Paul says it over and over again, you elders, teach uh, the younger people, but teach them with patience and kindness, not authority. <laughs> Don't rule over people. Well, I've got a thing, I've got a thinking that, that, that Jim might have done it that way. <laughs> he was a man of the law, and he, might, he, he may have been a man of very little tolerance, particularly for new stuff. You know, if there ever there was a man in a church that said, well, pastor, we just have never done it that way before. That guy would have been James. And sometimes, you know, we become the biggest obstacle of all Christianity. And it's not that we set out to be, but you see, this is the deal with Christianity. You have the influx or the input of the Spirit, right? But sadly, you have the old flux of who you are because you grew up. Maybe your parents dominated. Maybe your parents let you do anything you want. Maybe the world dominated you. Maybe the world let you do anything you want. You went to a strict school. You went to a school that didn't care. The, you know, I don't know what your history is, but I can guarantee whatever it is, even in the Cucaracha world, Whatever your history is, it has probably influenced you somehow. You know, you boys are young. You're strong and you're young men. And already your life has been influenced, I imagine, in a number of ways by your parents. And I'm not picking on you. I'm just showing you an example that you learned uh, things of value that probably Tim values. And you learned things of value that Racha probably values. Although you probably didn't understand them. <laughs> But nevertheless, <laughs> you guys are a product of your parents. And they are a product of their parents. And they are a product of their parents. Remember that thing I told you about? In what I say, 12 generations, it took 4,092 people to make chanter. You know, you got to ask, was it worth it? <laughs> But there's the influence, just in 12 generations, there's the influence of 4,092 people being passed on. Now, do I know what Aunt so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so -so said? No, but has that value been carried down? In many ways it has, because here I'm standing as a minister before you. Trained in the art of the word, trained in the manner of sacrament, and worship. My family was a very religious family, as far as I can think, all the way back, 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 back. I was the one that said, I'm not buying it. 12 years of Catholic school. I'm not buying it. I went to the University of Florida. You know how many times I went to church? Zero. Eleven. <laughs> <laughs> And I can tell you why I know that. Because I met a blonde that wore short skirts, particularly a green one with ruffles, <laughs> that I kind of liked a lot. And she would not go out on a date with me unless I went to church with her six times. That was her rule. Stupid rule. So I went five times and then I missed one because the fraternity was having a championship thing and I was one of the athletes for them. So I missed it. Well, she made me start over. So I had to go six more times. I went 11 times <laughs> to go out on a date with this woman. Now, did I get anything out of that 11 times? Just more of the, oh God, I put up with this. In high school and grade school. And now here it starts again. Well, see, that's the product of my upbringing. Do you know my mother used to hold on to me when I was a little boy and say, you're going to do something great for God one of these days? And I'd say, Mom, please stop saying that. You embarrass me in front of all the other guys. We're going to go out and play baseball. Okay, but remember, you got to do something great for God. Oh, please stop that. That's what I grew up with. I didn't have a father anymore. He died when I was young. 
But my mother, boy, she was pushing one thing and one thing only. And that was that Tom was going to be involved in God. And my mother had this carved into her brain. And she wanted me to be involved with God as a T. But Tom said he liked... This was the new input from the University of Florida. This was the old output or input from mom. So there was an incredible compromise made here. I went to church to get next to the skirt. I eventually married the skirt and had to go back to church. Mom kind of was disappointed that I was going to the Protestant church. <laughs> she did not like me going to the Protestant church. But that's where I went because the Protestant church believed in the little green skirt. <laughs> And I could get married in the little in the Protestant church. And of course, this is when God stepped in and said, Jenner, you haven't got a clue what you're gonna do. And after that it was what it was. Am I partly a product of my parents? Oh yeah, oh yeah. You know why we have a Ash Wednesday service? Because I grew up and I had an Ash Wednesday serve. One day a year I was allowed to have dirt on my head and my mother didn't care. She didn't have to say, go wash your face, you look like an idiot. Usually I did from playing baseball, sliding in the base, playing football, sliding in the mud. One day a year, mom said it was okay to have ashes on your head. How many Protestant churches have Ash Wednesday services? Well, some do, but not... Not like the Catholics. No, not like the Catholics. We do. Are we holier than all the others? No, hardly. But, see what I'm trying to tell you? Now, put James in all this place. Forget about me. Put James in here. What can be the biggest problem to James? Well, the biggest problem to James is James. Why? Because of his influence. His parents, who are also priests. In fact, there was a... Said, you got to be a man of what? Of the law. you got to uphold this law, believe this law. Worse, you got to enforce this law. Now, we Protestants do that as well, don't we? Haven't we relegated God to a bunch of do's and don'ts? Maybe, late, maybe earlier, as not so much today. But for many years in the Protestant movement, boy, if you did any of these things, you were, whoa, nasty. The old expression, don't spit, don't drink, don't smoke, don't chew, and don't hang out with women that do. Right? We did the same thing as the priest did in the law. Relegated God to a bunch of dietary codes, a bunch of behavioral mo modifications. And this almighty, great, powerful God that said, let there be light, when ignited the universe, has been reduced to a set of do's and don'ts. And if you don't do the do's and do do the don'ts, then you're not allowed to come to God anymore. I said so. Really? Do any of you in this room believe that Tom Channer can keep you or prevent you from standing or living or being in the presence of God? Really? Not hardly.
I'm not trying to be ridiculous, but churches do it every day. Denominations do it every day. In fact, denominations go to war over it. Yeah, you may be holy, but you're not as holy as us. I hate ministers' meetings. You know why? Because you know what ministers do when they get together? One up each other. Bingo, right there, what Benny said. They try and one up each other in everything. Well, I'm holier than you. Well, I'm holier. Well, I got more people in my church than you got. Well, I got bigger buildings. Well, I have a better salary. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Hold up, guys. Isn't there another player we're forgetting to, you know, give a chance to come onto the field? There you go, Tom. You're just being flip. You just don't like to go to meetings. Well, that's true. I don't. <laughs> but on the other hand, if the meeting is going to be devoid of this and a whole lot of this or this, then you know what? My character, who I am from all that influenced me, is not going to sit well there. And I know that. I am going to ruin your meeting. So it's better that I don't go than be a man of James. And see, here's James's problem. He was an aggravate, aggravator. He was an adjutant because he thought he was doing good for God. But then again, so did Paul when Paul was killing Christians. He was doing good for God. Remember, Paul and James are... Well, Paul was more political, I'll give him that. But Paul and James were pretty much in the same boat when it came to this law. He even says there, if you fail... In one law, what have you failed in? The entire law. And if you fail in the entire law, how can you ever be saved or come back to the presence of God again? I use a chanter expression that you've heard many times. This is the great cliff of life. Here you are down here. Well, your arms are longer. And you're hanging on to a chain. And this is the tree of life which the chain goes around. This chain is the law. Down here is eternal damnation and the fires of hell. How many, how many links have to break? Just one. One, it could be the main link around the tree, or it could be one of these other crazy links, do's and don'ts, rules and regulations that somebody has put on you to say, if you don't take care of this, you're going to go to hell. And we've said that for hundreds of years. You know, part of the, part of the protestant, I love that, don't you? Oh, we're Protestants. No, you're not. You're a protestant. They left Europe because the church said, you guys have broke too many of these chains. You're going down to hell for sure. That includes all the Asbarians, the Wesleyans, the Calvins, the Armenians, even the Zinzendorfs. Those were all reformers. They were all protestants. Because the church of all of Europe was Catholic, they said, oh, you, you know, you busted some laws here, pal. You broke that one and this one and that one. And, well, you're pretty much done. Well, we call it, you remember what we called it when they all ran away from Europe? The what? Your fire year? The fire year. Pioneer. Oh, pioneer. I can't understand Cogarancho. I have filters on. No, the Protestant Reformation. What is a Reformation? 
Reform. Reform. We're going to do it better. That's what reform, Reformation means. We're going to do it better. We're going to do God better than the Catholics are doing God. Well, isn't that nice? First thing they did was they booted Mary. We don't have any Blessed Mother Mary, which 19 million statues to, and 17 stations of the cross. She just doesn't carry the prominence in the Protestant heart, as does Jesus. Now, Jesus, we've really gone to town on him, boy. And he gets all the main number one billing, even to the detriment of the Holy Spirit and the Lord. That is, until the movement came about the whole tongues and the Holy Spirit then. Then the Protestants said, you mean we can jump and scream and have a good time? Yep, okay, we're in. Holy Spirit's part of our guy now. That wasn't always the case. The reformers that came over here and started this crazy country, America, they weren't jumping and screaming in those days. They weren't. They were studying, they were reading. In fact, the Bible was probably the only school book they had. Little children were learning to read from the Bible. America was for a short time very godly. But then, you know, things change. People came along and said, you know, the Protestants are uh, they're all right, but you know what we can do? We can do it better. Well, did they do it better? The evangelical movement started and some people were getting holier than holy and we said, oh man, they're so holy, so heavenly, they're no earthly good. And then the jumpers and screamers started and all the use or, and abuse of tongues and all those different gifts of the Spirit which were being used as clubs to beat people into submission so they'll do God right. Darn it. You're not doing God right. I will tell you how to do God right. Well, that kind of reeks of this, doesn't it? Back to the law. Well, now where has it gone? Well, we can... We can do it. Better. How did they do it better now? Buddy, we are 2024. We are 2,024 years into this Jesus thing, and we know how to do it. We have open hearts, we have open minds, and we have open doors. Anything goes. And this Word of God, which is this law thing, that's got to go. Because now it's better. Everybody can come to God. There is nothing stopping them. You can worship any way you want, anywhere you want. Absolutely no rule, no regulation, no determinant. You go find God, you go find God. You guys in the back go find God. Where? I don't know. We've kind of come back around to the 70s, remember? when we were all in search for significance. I need significance in my life. What does that mean? I had significance in the 70s in my life. She wore a pretty green skirt. <laughs> and if you don't believe that was significant, I got news for you. I threw out my entire collection of Encyclopedia Britannicas. I didn't need them anymore. I had something significant in my life. That's going to get me. This is who we are as people. My opinion on all this, it's like Jimmy Buffett says, religion's in the hand of some crazy people. He, he put an expletive in there. Religion is in the hands of some crazy people. Well, it goes way, way back to the first apostles. And they did great for a while. 
But then right off the bat, I mean, first batter up. Some are yelling about the law. They're not, uh, uh, all these Gentiles aren't adhering to the law. They were making the Greeks get circumcised for crying out loud. Boy, there's a party. Others were saying it wasn't necessary. Others were saying it was. Two of our holiest apostles, Paul and Peter, they went to blows. <laughs> hated each other most of their lives. In the name of God, however, they hated each other. It was James who tried to settle the two of them down. He got in the middle of it to where they got so angry with him, they pushed him off the temple. <laughs> oh, well, he won't be a problem any longer. James was the one that's trying to say, whoa, hold up, fellas. Maybe we're not doing something right here. When did God become such a problem for men and women? Who made God the creator from Adam and Eve till now? Who made God such a headache, such a pain in the neck? Well, the answer to that is very easy. Go look in the mirror. That's who made God a pain in the butt. Chapter 4 of James is just that. Don't be me. How many times have I heard that in my life? Tom, don't be you tonight. Okay. I still don't know what that means, but... James knew he was problematic. He probably literally... I don't know this for a fact. This is Tom Chandler's speculation based on everything I know about the Bible. But I don't think him and his brother got along so well. Now, his brother was probably a lot more patient than Jimbo was. But Jimbo had to learn to be patient. You know, we always pray to God for patience, don't we? And we want it when? Yeah. Right now. <laughs> I don't know how to P A T I E N C E. Is that right? Yeah. All right. That I and E thing still aggravates me to this day. The nuns beat that into my head with a ruler, and I still have a problem with the I E or E I. F except after C, and I said, what's the Navy got to do with any of this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I am still a product of my upbringing. I'll never escape it. So I embrace it, and I make fun of it. <laughs> Which is actually a judgment upon it that Jem says we're not allowed to do. Yeah, but what does he know? He's a man of law. Well, he knows as much as I know, and you know what we both know together, and we share with you, is that sometimes the biggest problems in religion come from you from each and every one of us. And to deny that, as James says here, you call God a liar. He says you can serve the Lord. That implies a clear understanding of the Lord. Or you can apply yourself to the world, which involves a clear understanding of the world, of which you are not only a part of, but infected by by this time in your life. You haven't been living with God, but you have been living in the world, right? Sure you have. You're bombarded by it every day. Advertisements, radio, CDs, videos. Well, that crap existed when we were kids. But it exists now. And it's very influential. I was driving down the street the other day and I heard a song. I sang that song all afternoon. Stupid song, but I sang it all afternoon in my brain. Do you know why I sang it all afternoon in my brain? Because I learned it as a child. This is Peter, Paul, and Mary, last week's sermon on Puff the Magic Dragon. Have you ever sang that song? Where do he live? By the sea. He was trying to figure out this IE crap. 
except after C. So Puff moved to the C to figure it out. I thought that was the greatest song when I was five. Now I'm older and I still have that song in my brain such that I can hear it once on the radio and sing it all afternoon and even aggravate my wife enough to say stop it. I do that with monkeys hits a lot because I know she hates the monkeys. She says no more monkey songs. I said at first I didn't believe her but then I saw her face. <laughs> Yeah, that went over about as well there, too. <laughs> the point is, we are a product of ourselves, of our upbringing. And we need to be concerned about that because we're not always doing it better. We're not doing it better for ourselves, and we're certainly not doing it better as any favor to anybody else. You think about the church today, many denominations, where do they literally stand on God? Anywhere you want them to. Well, what's the old expression, sailor? If you stand for anything, everything, you believe in nothing. You believe in nothing if you stand for it. God has very marked parameters around Him. There is no mistake in that. There is the God and there is the world. James says, I know this now and I failed the Lord. This whole time I've been thinking the world. And I've been using God's own law to beat you into submission so that you'll do it the right way. And I'm the right way. I'm kind of like God. Really. What's the source of your quarrels and the conflict in the body of Christ here? What is it that's waging war in your hearts and your minds, worse in your congregations and in your lives? Do you think you're doing it better than her or she's doing it better than him? If you do, then subsequently there comes judgment. And if there comes judgment, then there comes separation. And if there's separation, then you are no longer part of the body of Christ because I, I am the body of Christ. Of course, now you're sitting over here saying, no, I am the body of Christ. And of course, the sailor in the back. He's got the I, E, and the C thing figured out. He's the naval body of Christ. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Where do, who wins? Certainly not the Lord. Because we're all tucking on our shirts and pulling up our drawers. and We're right. Nobody else is right. Now, I go back to those examples again. The woman caught in adultery. Was she right or wrong? Because determining how you answer that question will determine whether she lives or dies. Right or wrong? Caught in the very act. Guilty. Guilty. Why? Because we know God. And God says, pick up this rock and crush her skull. Jesus jumped in front of that mob and said, I don't think you're right. God didn't create her so you can crush her skull. To her, to God, she's very precious. Very unique, handmade, you might want to say. Handmade. I'm handmade. You know, when you think about it, she and I have one thing in common. We are perfectly unique to ourselves. We are endangered species. You should pass legislation and protect us. But then again, we can all say that, couldn't we? Hmm. So does that mean that we all believe in God any way we want? You know, there's a book in the Bible about that. It's 
called Judges. Do you ever read Judges? Wonderful book. Talks about the stupidity of humankind. When they dared to stand up and say, I am the Lord God. And each one did what was right in his own eyes. That's how the Bible puts it. <clears throat> each one made it better in his own eyes. And each one did what? Got into a bunch of trouble. You know, I kind of, if, if you read it, it's like 12 cycles. It's not like we learned on one or two, you know. God gave us 12, and it starts where, you know, we say, I am the Lord, and then we go this way, and bad stuff happens. And then we go this way, and then there's great suffering. R-I-N-G. And then we go this way, and we cry, and we say, Lord, maybe I screwed up. And the Lord forgives us. He raises up a judge and forgives us. And we come right back to square one where we're all holy again. And we come over here and we say we're all holy. And then what do we do? I'm right. Nobody else is right. So we come over here and we do stuff that we shouldn't do. And then we come down here and what happens? We suffer. And then we come up here and we see that it's not going to get any better. So we cry. And then God raises up another judge and brings us back to here where we go over here. And we start over again 12 times. And each time the suffering here is like a few people. And here it's like 50 people. And here it's like 300 people. And here, by the time you get down here, it's thousands. Haven't learned the lesson. But each one did what was right in his own eyes. And if you got a law backing up your thinking, you become a dangerous man or a dangerous woman. Yes, to everybody else, but mostly to yourself. Once you put that point right here, oh, well, I'm right. Everybody else is wrong. You got to realize a bunch of that I'm right stuff has been put into you from the world, not from the Lord. The Lord says, if you think you're right, well, what makes her wrong? She might be more right than you. I like the way Charles Dickens put it. When Mr. Scrooge, remember him? And he said, will the child live? Remember that? Tiny Tim, talking about Tiny Tim. Will the child, tell me, spirit, will the child live? Well, if he's going to die, he should do it and decrease the surplus population. Remember that? And old Scrooge gets a little bent out of shape. Oh, so you're using my own words against me. Exactly. Then the spirit says something most remarkable. Maybe before you open your mouth in ignorance, you might find out who the surplus population are. It could well be that in the eyes of God, this child is worth more than you'll ever be. And every child like him. That's what James just said in chapter 4. Judge not, lest ye be judged. It might well be that that person next to you is a million times more precious in God's eyes than you will ever be. Not that you're not precious in God's eyes. But we can't see like God. We don't have the eyes of God. We don't have the ears of God. I hope we have the Spirit of God. Because if we do, then we wouldn't be making those judgments, would we? Oh my gosh, what a mess. Next time you think you're trying to make it better, you might want to go back to square one. You know, I used to have a minister friend. He was part of the Four Square Gospel Church. You ever heard of them? Four Square Church. And he would always make the joke. 
he, he'd introduce himself before he spoke. He says, I'm Reverend such and such. He says, I'm a highly regarded minister in the Four Square Gospel Church. And he'd say, which I really don't care for much because that lets three other people's opinions in. <laughs> they just need one square. <laughs> Me. <laughs> I'd sit there. Now, nobody would get that joke except ministers that have studied the Word of God. You know, I get that, boy. It's no wonder when God created the earth, He didn't consult a committee. <laughs> he just said, let there be, and there was. Let there be, and it was. We don't need any committee here. God was like me. He didn't want to go to the minister's meeting. Oh, wait a minute. God like me? Or me like Him? Both of us like Moses. Moses had a real problem with his people. He came to God. He had, he had the audacity to come to God and say, these people are arrogant. They're selfish, conceited, aggravating to no end. God's sitting back going, yeah, so what's your point? So are you. <laughs> You have a lot in common, Moses. You want to read chapter 4 of James again now? It might mean a little bit more to you. Last week we saw James' resume. Smallest part of the body wrecking the whole ship. Smallest fire in the world burning down the whole forest. Now, this week, we find out what the real cause of it is. And all I was trying to do, this is the mother-in-law line. I only had your best interests in my heart. <laughs> as long as you do it my way. Because it's better than your way. Mm-hmm. Like that match and throw it into the forest. Then we don't understand why it's not the happiest day of our lives. Well, it could have been. But somebody tried to do it better. Gives you a lot to think about when you're talking about Christianity. Paul even said, What kind of Christian am I becoming? He explained to Timothy that everything he thought was right is wrong. Everything he thought was of value is but, well, his term was manure. Next to knowing Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. God, number one, for me to live is God. Anything else is an option that we don't necessarily need. In most cases, probably not at all. Jesus and James had a problem. He even talked to James and said, James, if what goes into a mouth defiles the man, how long is he defiled? Until he goes to the bathroom, right? <laughs> you run only for two days, you know, until that burger comes out the other end. Don't reduce God to such stupid things as that. And worst, lord it over others that they have to reduce God to stupid things like that. We're talking about an almighty God who in a single word ignited everything. Paul's prayer, if you remember in his word, was I wish that I could understand so I could make you understand the height, the width, the depth, and the breadth of God. Because if I could do that, all oh, this other nonsense would disappear. You would be lost in God so much. Nothing else would, would mean anything. I think Paul was getting very close to that. On his way to the gallows or on his way to the head chopper offer, when he said, for me to live is Christ, to die in a few minutes will be my gain. It'll be a gain that none of you will ever take away. It'll be a gain that none of you could ever take away. It's 
just I didn't know that before. It'll be a gain that you yourselves also have. And no amount of my preaching is going to take that away from you either. I wish I could know the height, the depth, the width, and the breadth of God. Because if I could give you that, you would never even consider all this other nonsense of which I have wrestled my whole life. Old Jimbo's coming to the day of reckoning, uh, what do you call it, reconciliation? The day of reckoning. That's what I'm looking for. Jimbo says, I know the enemy. And he is me. Alright, that's chapter 4, folks. 3 told us the dangers of being wrong. 4 tells us the person who is being wrong. What is the trouble of your quarrels, your angers, and your judgments? I gotta go.